You know, Itron's been a public company for um, a few years. Um, and a few years ago, we had, it's, it's an interesting space. It's been interesting for a number of years, as you said, from about 2000, it started to uh, uh, become more um, uh, visible. But before that, we had six analysts that followed us. That was it. And those are very good, knowledgeable analysts that understand, uh, understood our space in the water, gas, electric industry. But in the last few years, you know, what you guys have been doing with regards to clean tech, um, we now have 32 analysts that cover us. So you can see that our uh, investor relations person and myself are pretty busy. Um, every single one of those 32 analysts have lots of advice to give you. They want you to appear at every one of their investor conferences and speak at those and you end up having one-on-ones with a significant number of people. Um, and the visibility is there. So um, it, it's those for those companies in the room who are private and want to go public, there's some significant advantages and disadvantages to being a public company. Obviously, you have access to capital, but you have to go to these conferences. And when you've got that many to deal with, it's, uh, it's a lot of uh, time on the road, and it gets old after a while. But anyway, we have 32, we have 32 analysts that follow us. Some are good, and some are uh, not so good. An interesting statement is the way we manage the world's energy and water will shape this century. That's an interesting statement and it's one I'm convinced is true. And we understand the challenges our utility customers face in meeting increased energy consumption. And we've all seen the statistics and we know that we can't produce enough generation to meet the growing demand. Not only, not only will energy resources be strained, but water supply shortages will likely become a certainty. So this is where ITRON and our many global partners have joined forces to create what I call a new rooted in reality flexible solutions. I'm going to talk for the next 30 minutes on the reality of the smart grid. Because utilities around the globe are all different, all of them. And I'm talking some that are small municipalities and some that are enormous like EODF where they have 35 million install base. So they all want something slightly different. Utilities need to have an intelligent infrastructure to quickly adapt to the changing demands and to be positioned for emerging applications such as conserving water and gas, pluggable electric vehicles, smart appliances in the home, which I'll talk about later, outage detection, and a lot more. This requires new thinking, it requires new tools, and the right partners because you cannot do this alone to ensure success. We have 75 partners that we deal with. So not only do I have 32 analysts, sell side analysts, I've got 32 partners that want to deal with us every day. And because building smarter systems to support these applications is complex, we view partnerships with established companies with direct expertise as a key to success. And we believe there is no one vendor or technology can lead us to the future we all seek. So it's all about collaboration. And simply stated, the way we manage the world's energy and water will shape this century. This is an interesting slide, isn't it? For some of you who have, I heard that uh, a comment a few minutes ago. Um, and I'll talk a bit more about stealing power in a few minutes. But everybody in our industry knows that the only thing we can expect is more change. Change around regulations, change around carbon emissions, and also around renewables. And we know also know that while the population growth in some parts of the United States and Western Europe is fairly flat, our energy consumption, as you saw earlier from Ira, is anything but flat. The fact is we can't produce enough generation to meet the growing demand. And in many countries, what they do is just steal it. It's actually a national pastime in a couple of countries where 
they refer to it as non-technical losses. Non-technical losses, that's a nice word for stealing. And we, we're right there providing what we call smart payment systems to help the utilities and help the consumers by where you buy electricity before you use it. We've got about 5.5 million customers that we manage uh, in South Africa. Just imagine, they have ESCOM as the utility. They provide electricity to about, as I say, about 5.5 million customers or maybe more. And some don't have a street address and many don't have a bank account. So how do they buy power? So they go to their vendor and there's 40,000 vendors that serve these townships and they go and buy power and pay, and pay 50 rand for an amount of electricity. And then they get a 20 digit number and go back to their home and put in that 20 digit code and the lights come on because there's a switch inside every meter. And the same in Indonesia, they don't have power. 40% of the population of Indonesia don't have access to power. So what they're doing is they start, instead of just issuing a credit meter, which is what we have, they're issuing and installing debit meters. We recently won some large contracts in Indonesia. They have a factory there that produces significant number of smart payment meters. But at the same time, utilities are typically under a lot of pressure to keep the rates low. And this puts, a very uncom this puts us in a very uncomfortable position. We're expected to keep rates low while ensuring there is a plentiful supply of green energy. And we know how much green energy costs us with regards to credits that you get. You only need to look at the trends for energy and water scarcity, the projected use and cost to understand that energy efficiency is no longer optional. And remember, which is good for us, you can't manage what you don't measure. Interesting slide. Many countries around the world, many states in the United States, and now provinces, are mandating renewable energy increases. Europe does have an energy policy. The Energy Service Directive there <clears throat> is 2020-20 by the year 2020. 20% 20 carbon reduction, 20% energy efficiency improvements, and 20% renewables. And we're all familiar in the United States with these kinds of regulations, even though we don't have an energy policy here. And we know that mandates like this have an enormous implication on our grid for funding and for consumer engagement and much more. When I talk about Europe with 2020, there are 27 countries and within those countries, there are a significant number of utilities that have to mandate putting in smart meters. And Brazil is doing the same thing. When I say putting in smart meters, there's 200 million electricity meters that they have to replace in, the, in Europe by the year 2020. And there's 100 gas meters, natural gas meters, that they have to replace. That's in nine years, 300 million. And then most of them are inside the home. But in worldwide, there's 2.6 billion electric gas and water meters around the world. And in order to provide the information that consumers are looking for and their usage on their usage, it's necessary to change over all of these to smart devices over the next, what, 25 years? Just sat through this great presentation and discussion on the gas industry. Recently, I was asked to speak at the American Gas Association, sharing ITRON's smart gas vision. You know, the natural gas industry has done an unbelievable job over the past 20 years, with natural gas being the fuel to generate over 30% of the electricity in North America. It's clean, it's efficient, it's transportable, abundant, with over 100 years of domestic identified supply. And together, gas utilities and pipeline companies, they spend close to $7 billion per year, per year, to ensure that natural gas is delivered safely and reliably. And in light of the recent event that took place in San Bruno, where there was a significant explosion and 47 homes were destroyed, safety is top of mind as never before. As we know, the gas infrastructure is not something that can be readily see or, or accessible. And technology has got to play a very critical role in improving today's processes. With the likely possibility of new legislation requiring more safety audits, natural gas transportation initiatives, as well as possible rate recovery for accelerating infrastructure improvements. Our business is transforming. 
It's imperative that we start to evaluate the next generation of technology to improve the safety features. We have now put safety valves inside meters so that when a utility or a consumer starts to smell gas, we can send a signal down to the meter and switch the gas off before the truck arrives and beat the truck. That's what we're trying to do and that's what we're doing. So with all of those definitions and all of those changes that are making in the gas industry, like what we call cathodic protection and making sure that there's no corrosion that takes place on those, on those pipes below the ground, we have this enormous vision that the gas industry is going to transform over the next few years. And our gas customers also share that vision. We also know that the global water demand is projected to grow, I believe, 53% by the year 2030. But it's interesting to know that we take water in this country for granted. We do. We turn the tap on and you get water. It's only when supply is low is our awareness high. I remember living in California in the 80s and there was a term, and I won't really say that, but some of you may remember, when it's yellow, let it mellow. When it's brown, you know what to do. But that's what they used to say because I remember in Santa Barbara, they almost ran out of water. I lived in, <clears throat> I lived in a, uh, Thousand Oaks at the time, and it was a significant problem. And what have we done? We've basically forgotten about it. But in many parts of the world, there are huge, huge water losses, referred to as non-revenue water. Let's just talk about here in the United States. In the Northeast, there are pipes that are over 100 years old. And some parts of California also have pipes 100 years old, and they're made of wood, and they leak. Yes, they're made of wood. In other countries around the world, there are 300, water, 300 million water connections that are not metered. And remember what I said before, you can't manage what you don't monitor. And Nitron is right there to help. For example, let me give you a couple of examples. In the UK, we're deploying 1 million smart meters, smart water meters, to help reduce operational cost and avoid meter readers entering the home because every water meter is probably under the stairs and very difficult to get to. In India, we have a project that we're working with the Mumbai municipality on solving water losses. The way that we get water, we take for granted. We turn the tap on, we get water. The way those guys do it, in many parts of India, they, have to, they only have access to water for two hours a day. In those two hours, they have an electric motor and a meter and a pump, and they pump the water into a holding tank in the roof, and then they, that is their water supply for the next 22 hours until the pressure is high enough they can do it again. So we're helping the, city, the, the, the municipality of Mumbai save them 185 million gallons per day. That's how much water loss is in India. And also in the city of Cleveland here in Ohio, we're installing over 400,000 homes with our smart metering systems to improve their efficiency. So ITRON's worldwide investment in the water solutions industry are helping save this precious resource one drop at a time. You know, it's important to uh, understand the first key to the utility benefits um, are what we call the benefits and business case. The business cases are important if they have to go through the Public Service Commission, um, and only the stimulus money that really accelerated a lot of this has now stopped. There's no more stimulus money. Now, because of the environment, we know that utilities need to hit certain benchmarks to get specific value from investments in the smarter grid. And I'll just give you a few key areas that we know are important. The regulatory environment. Water is not regulated, but gas and electricity is regulated. That's key. Growing demand and the cost of generation. Also, that's obvious. Energy efficiency goals are being mandated. Reducing operational cost is critical because you have to do it at the right price. And business cases, 50% of most business cases are based on eliminating meter readers and of course revenue assurance. And all these forces, they influence one another and are certainly influencing utility about how they do business, about how they invest or not invest in new infrastructure, and how they will ultimately engage the end consumer. And when you think about the smart grid, it really comes down to three things. Supply advantage, 
operational improvement and customer engagement. Let me just talk a little bit about all three of those. Supply advantage, let's talk about net metering. Net metering is important because if you're putting energy into the, if you're consuming energy at one particular rate and you're pushing energy inside the, into the grid with solar energy, you need net metering solutions. But the price of what's going into the grid may be different than what's going out. So renewables will play a very important part, but you have to have specific smart solutions to make things work. The cost of new generation is coming down of course, and carbon levels, carbon levels are obviously continuing to be reduced. We talk about operational improvements. This helps reduce cost, allowing utilities to not only keep consumer costs in check and improve reliability, but allow the utility to reinvest in operations in a smarter way. A couple of examples. Remote disconnect and reconnect. All the meters that are installed in the United States don't have a disconnect switch. They're starting to get deployed with disconnect switches. What does that do for us? In Texas, for example, we, send, we provide the, the, the billing or the information about how much a consumer is con using every 15 minutes. It goes to ERCOT, and what ERCOT does then is send it out to all the retail energy providers, which means that in Texas, you can change your energy provider every 30 days. You can do that. Which means that if you do that, you need to read the meter, and if they have a move in, move out case, they actually switch the meter off. What does that do? It saves truck, ro it saves truck rolls, a significant amount of truck rolls. At the same time, when you put new solutions in, you get better billing accuracy. It's much better than having a handheld device where they make mistakes. And the workforce, you saw earlier from, uh, from Ira that said, not a lot of people have been moving into the energy space in the United States, in the utility industry. So their aging workforce is getting older. And of course, outage detection. It's important to beat the consumer to the phone, to tell him he's just had a brownout or he's just experienced a, a blackout and he doesn't realize it. And finally, consumer engagement. This is probably the most interesting part of this whole discussion and what's going on with the smart grid. It's got to be seamless. It has to be seamless. If it's considered to be difficult to do, I don't think anybody's going to do it. So web presentment is very important. But what happens if you don't have a computer at home? And many particular locations in, in Texas, they don't. So you have to put in-home displays there. Those in-home displays have to be communicated to actually show just exactly how much energy you're consuming on a, on a 15 minute interval basis. Programmable appliances. The smart grid, what that's gonna do for us is it's gonna say, let's switch on the dishwasher when it's cheapest at nighttime, just automatically. Let's do the washing machine, put it on before you go to bed and it automatically comes on when it's cheap enough. How do you do that when you don't have time use rates? Today, there's only one utility in the United States, or maybe a couple, that have got time of day or time of use rates. They don't exist today. But when you pick up any newspaper today or auto magazine, you can't help but find an article about the promise of electric cars. Let's say it's taken 120 years to develop the infrastructure for refueling the gasoline-powered engine. And there are about 200,000 gas stations in the United States and Canada. And it takes about three minutes to fill up your car. It's called an inconvenient necessity. And for that, you get about 350 miles. How much would you get if you did that with an electric vehicle? You get around the corner. We know that for utilities, the electric vehicle charging system is going to add an amazing amount of complexity and risk. The act of simply plugging in may seem to be a benign routine, but underneath the cover is a complex problem yet to be solved. Just look at one example, well, I'll give you two. Transformer loading. Consider the Nissan Leaf. Charging needs 6.6 .6 kilowatts. And the Chevy Volt needs 3.3 kilowatts, equal to the average home in Berkeley. Now what happens when everybody gets home from work on a hot day, air conditioner running, the stove's on, and two flat screen TVs running, and everybody plugs the car in? How much load does that create on the system? Not only the system, but just talk about a distribution transformer. One distribution transformer covers about four, five to six homes. Imagine multiple PUVs coming home in the garages and all plugging in at the same time. It's a serious problem. And that's just the load on the system. And there are so many other considerations. Billing, gasoline tax recovery, mobility, carbon credits, the help desk. Which help desk do you call if you can't get power? 
the electric, the electric utility or the car company. Data security and privacy. They know when you're in, they don't know when you're in. Utilities are coming to ITRON to look at how to leverage our knowledge of smarter billing systems, load measurements, and ways to integrate smart charging systems with residential metering. As I said on my previous slide, in developing countries, theft is huge. But here it's not as big. Not yet. So what happens when everybody plugs into your neighbor's house? Or your house? There is a big extension cord. You need to have all these billing systems in place. So these are just very important questions that I'm talking about reality. So let's expand this further. Let's talk about how energy is distributed. Take the premise of microgeneration. Microgeneration, we're talking about, you know, power plants, we get it today from coal and gas, etc. But pa power generation, but home solar panels and windmills are really getting to be quite inexpensive. And the grid needs to be much smarter to accommodate those kinds of things. When you look at the projections for energy consumption, it's clear we need a combination of new, clean energy and smarter ways to use the power. And residential micro application, residential micro applications are becoming, as I said, much more affordable. But let's take a simple example. What happens today if a tree falls down and pulls down a power line? Simple. In simple terms, the utility defines which power line is down, de-energizes de the line, and then works to repair and restore the power very quickly. But with the microgeneration, the utility needs to know much more information. Is the downed power line live from that microgeneration? So this leads to where ITRON's been focused its efforts in the intelligent grid. It needs to address all of these issues that we've discussed, developing practical, reliable, cost-effective, and trusted solutions. At ITRON, we view the intelligent grid in the context of six essential elements. Each of these elements must be presented and carefully thought through. Architecture, critical. It's got to be secure. Let's just talk about that for a second. It's two-way communication. If one hacker gets in there, could he hack the whole of a 500,000 point uh, substation and get in there and shut the whole system down? This is FERC's real issue. And if you can get some smart hackers that go in, it is a serious problem we would have. It's got to be secure. It's also got to be scalable. And today in parts of France, let me just give you the example, ERDF, they read their meters once a year and bill once a month with an estimate. They're going to go to hourly data, maybe 15 minute interval data at certain points. Just look how much scale that's going to take. It's enormous. So scalability is absolutely critical. Communications have got to be flexible and reliable. The reliability of our, of our grid system today is about 99.99%. If all of these solutions start coming in and it's not reliable and flexible, just imagine what's going to happen. Advanced metering is still at the center, of course, thanks to, thanks to that. And consumer engagement with broad optionality, and again, it's got to be seamless. Energy delivery, improving reliability and efficiency, and of course, the software that needs to be created from all of that data. But I'm not going to miss an opportunity to talk a little bit about ITRON. We're a public company. We traded on NASDAQ. For those of you who want more information, uh, you can go there. We're a leading end-to-end -end solutions provider in the space. In the space, we provide water, gas, electric solutions to the industry with software um, and, inst and uh, installation services. And we are a global company that we call, it operates locally. We're in 130 countries. We have 60 sales offices. And operating locally means that you have to speak in 27 different languages. That's what we do. And we also have 27 different currencies that we have to deal in. We started in the 70s in a place in Idaho. And for 20 years, we did water, gas, and electric reading systems. In 2000, and f in 2000, and then a series of software acquisitions. And then in 2004, we really entered into the metering space by buying the Slumberger electricity metering business. And then in 2007, we ended up buying a company in Europe called Actaris that used to be part of Slumberger as well. And so in total, we do about, oh, I don't know, maybe 27 million meters per year. 
That's significantly improving now with the smart installations that are going up. Um, and we provide total end-to-end -end solutions, not just from smart meters, but communication networks, meter reading systems, and meters and meter data management systems. We have the broadest portfolio in the industry, and we spend about $140 million on R&D a year. I'm certainly not going to go into the detail of a financial review here, but this is just the last two, four, six, seven quarters ending in Q3 of 10. But I thought you'd like to see this slide because $389 million a quarter in Q1 of 09 and now in Q3 of 10 we did $576 million. When we bought the Actaris business, we borrowed $1.7 billion. The CEO at the time came to me and said, we'd like you to go and run that overseas but don't screw it up. Since then, we've paid down 1.1 billion. Significant amount of pay down. I don't like running companies where you've got to have, we have an, an enormous amount of debt. Our business is global and opportunities are enormous. So some final thoughts. There's no denying that the utility industry is evolving. In my experience, and I've been in this industry, as Iris said, quite a few years, today it's at light speed. They're very, very conservative. They have to be, especially in the United States because we have the most reliable systems in the world. And the way we apply technology is crucial. Just as technological innovation shaped the 20th century, energy and water issues promise to shape the 21st century. This shifting will change the way we look at the world, will change the way we do business, and will change the way we live our lives. And in closing, the way we manage the world's energy and water will shape this century. Thank you.